Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm just going to pop myself on spotlight there and welcome you all into today's session. I'm just going to um, allow any latecomers a few moments to come in. Uh, so I'm just going to say hi to all of you in a moment and give a proper full introduction to today's session. Um, but it is a joy to have you all here. Um, I decided to run today's session as a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar, which is the format we've used for some of the previous ones, because I miss seeing all your lovely faces. Um, it's like doing a talk to a room where everyone is wearing like a pillowcase over their head or something. Um, so do feel free to pop your video on if you'd like to. Stay muted, um, but do feel free to be on show. You don't have to be, of course. So if you're watching this from the bath or something like that, that is quite acceptable. Um, just make sure that you're feeling comfy and you're all nicely settled in. We're going to have a wonderful hour chatting to Amy Jury. So I'm going to give a proper introduction in just a second. Um, but I think we're all in. Excellent. Um, we may have some more people joining us. But I'm just going to um, welcome you all. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our first Etc. event of 2024. Uh, here at Draw, for those that don't know, because I know some people are new to Draw, um, here at Draw we run online and in-person drawing and painting and printmaking classes and Etc., which is the name for this session, is the name of our programme of artist talks, which we provide just to enrich that educational programme. So we put them on for free. It's funded by our supporters on Patreon. So if you'd like to support what we do, you can find a link which I'll put up in the chat in just a second and you can follow us for free or you can support us for three pounds a month um, or upwards which also gives you access to some of our learning resources if you wanted to support us putting more of these talks on but you are very welcome here today for free it's just wonderful to be able to share the work of some of the artists that we're going to be talking to over this year and today our first artist of the year is the wonderful Amy Jury who's going to be talking a little bit about her work and her route into painting. And um, so, uh, Amy, it is a pleasure to have you here. I'm just going to take myself, um, well, I'm going to add you actually to the spotlight, if that's okay. Um, and welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you so much, Jacob. It's great to be here. Hello, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Um, and I think we might as well just launch right in, if that's okay. Yes, I can see that. Yeah, so what, what we're looking at here is... Um, so I sort of decided to go right back to um, early days when I was doing printmaking. So I did my degree in printmaking um, at Glasgow School of Art, and I then I did an MA at Brighton University, where I carried on that um, trajectory with uh, much more, more and more bigger screen printings. I got really into screen printing, um, and. The reason I did printmaking really was because uh, a lack of confidence, to be honest, a lack of confidence in um, thinking that I could get onto the painting program at Glasgow. Glasgow was the school I wanted to go to um, because those of great painters had been there. Um, um, but I suddenly, at the last minute, thought, oh, I'll never get into painting. So I ticked the printmaking box because I knew I liked printmaking. And therefore, I ended up doing printmaking for um, several years, um, which was great. I loved it and um, I'm no regrets. Um, but it did mean that I sort of put the paintbrushes down and I didn't really paint, you know, really until quite recently, until about six or seven years ago when I started <laughs> seriously painting again. But these are some some big screen prints. These, these are really big. These are like life-size kind of size um, prints that I did. And what I thought was interesting about looking back at these was I thought, ah, oh, I was doing the same sort of thing. I was using photographs, photographic imagery. Um, and sort of incorporating those with sort of big bright colours and block colours and bits of drawn line and, um, you know, it's not a million miles away from what I'm doing now, you know, with mm -hmm. my painting. So um, I always find it interesting to go back and try and see those connections. And do you ever go back and do any printmaking now? Do you do any screen printing ever? Um, I, went, I did some etching last year and the year before. I did some, uh, I made a few etchings because I always liked etching. Um, and whilst it is a magical, beautiful process, I actually found myself getting really frustrated with it and just thinking, oh, it takes so long. It takes so long to, to do, then you've got to do this, then you have to do that, and then you wave the little flame, and then you do, you know, and there's just, it, whilst it's gorgeous, it, I, I, I'm so much quicker in the way I work now with painting. It suits me very well to be able to paint and to, to do things very quickly. Um, so I'm not sure 
if I'm ready to go back to the, that slow process where you have to be super prepared, you have to get all the things in a line at the beginning, and then, you know, there's this long process that you must carry out the steps in a certain order. Um, so I'm not sure that I want to do that right now. No, I think I'm mm -hmm. in the painting zone. And, and I mean, you said you you always had an interest in painting and it was the lack of confidence that meant that you sort of didn't apply for painting. But um, I guess as we were talking about this just now, you is it right that you wrote to Lucian Freud to ask him about uh, his painting and, and sort of established a, a connection there sort of um, with the mutual interest in painting? Yeah, yeah, that, that happened. That was when I was 17. I used to write to lots of famous people, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got all sorts of nice letters and cards um, that I've got back from various people over the years. You know, I was a mad letter writer. Um, I had a hundred pen friends at one time when I was a teen. <laughs> um, but uh, I wrote to him. He was my favourite painter. I loved his paintings. And uh, yeah, he wrote back and he actually invited me to go up and um, see his studio and see his meet his agent and all this and, and have a little bit of a, a dinner out on the town. It was very nice. And we sort of stayed in contact for uh, about 10 years. And um, so we used to, you know, I used to meet him every now and again, and we did some interesting things. Um, so it was a really interesting time. Yeah, it was it was great to, to know him and to get a bit of an insight into that world. And did that influence, I, may I click onto the, the painting slide, the next one yes. across? Um, so I was thinking, uh, I don't know if, uh, just wondered whether that influenced your painting in any way or whether that took its own separate route. Um, I suppose the only way that it's influenced it is, um, you know, it's always been about the figure and about portraits for me. Mm -hmm. That's that's just my favourite thing. And, you know, he's just obviously uh, so important in that field, um, you know, and I love the, the honesty of the, those paintings. Um, and I suppose these sorts of first ones I did, they're not, they're not really obviously very loose and Freudish. They've got a lot more kind of uh, narrative um, and an imagination in them, I suppose. He, he obviously liked to work from direct real life all the time. Whereas what I'm doing now is really working from photographs most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so quite different. These So these first paintings, was this your first foray back into painting since sort of teenagehood at this point? Yeah, yeah, really, really. Um, um, I've maybe done a few bits and bobs here and there, but uh, not seriously. And it was really to do with, um, I was teaching photography um, at a school here in Brighton. And I had the the sort of the, the whiff of a job that was coming up to be the, the head of this art department in this, this great college. Um, and I thought, I'd love that job, but I need to teach painting. It's really strong on painting. This college got a long tradition of great painting. And I thought, okay, so, uh, you know, I'll do a couple of art classes and some painting classes to um, get back in the swing a bit and learn how to mix colour and what do I need to know to teach painting. And that was the start of it, yeah. And that was the start of me um, actually putting some paint onto a canvas at long last. And these were um, painted on top of just like horrible charity shop canvases that had a horrible kind of photographic print on them. Um, but I was really pleased with them. They were photographs of... Um, my family you know past family um images i didn't have very many to work from but i think i just saw so much possibility once you start to, to isolate the um the interesting parts of the of the image or use color to to bring in um meaning or emotion uh, and i suddenly mm -hmm. saw this whole way that i could work so um if i click through again so you were saying about working from old photos uh, tell me a bit more about this here yeah, so um, this was interesting. So I, I did about, I don't know how many, five, six paintings from this one particular photographer called Nick Hedges. Um, and he took this photograph on the left here, which is, um, he used to take a lot of pictures of um, Glasgow and Edinburgh kind of slum conditions in the 60s. And I just love these photos so much that that was the next thing I did. Was I started just working from these photographs and cropping down and choosing the, the bits that I liked. And, and it was really a, a chance to experiment. It was a chance to experiment with things I was interested in, like uh, negative space and the use of the background colour and the use of line within painting. Um, so it really just was a, an excuse to play with these ideas. Um, mm -hmm. well, I did quite a few of these paintings and they, they worked well. Um, 
and then I wrote to Nick Hedges because I like writing to people mm-hmm. and um, I said um, I love your photographs and um, I've made these paintings of them thanks so much for your work and uh, he wrote back saying well uh, you know there's this issue of copyright and I was like no what's that well you've not heard of it but I didn't really understand it in the context of painting mm-hmm. um, so luckily though he he then um, said that it was fine and he liked my paintings and he sent me a signed book and all was well and I make sure that I obviously cite his name whenever I show any of these paintings and this one on, mm-hmm. on the right here is actually on the front cover of a of a novel in Italy um, it got published a few months ago um so I kind of had a bit of a steep learning curve there with, you know, using other people's photographs. You've got to be careful. You know, you don't want to be using uh, people's work if it's, if you, if it's not been um, approved. And probably best to use your own photographs, your own family photographs, or, you know, finding photographs that don't have uh, copyright issues, um, if that might be a problem. I suppose. Mm-hmm. I guess the kind of the internet can be a bit of a wild west as far as image permissions goes as well, right? I mean, sometimes things pop up. I mean, have you ever had your work shared without your permission that you're aware of? Oh, I mean, loads on Instagram. Yeah, sometimes I get like really quite big accounts will publish stuff. And I had a funny situation not long ago where someone sent me an image of a man in somewhere in South America winning an art competition. And he was standing with his painting and the painting was a copy of one of my paintings, Um, you know, done in a bit of different colours. But, you know, and this is one of my paintings that I've got, Mm. I've done, you know, quite recently. So that was very weird. And, you know, but he didn't ask for permission and I thought, well, it doesn't, so it's fine. But, um, yeah, sometimes things like that happen. Um, But I think generally with copyright, you know, it's what I hope is that people aren't really going to tend to, um, have a problem with it um, money wise because unless you're earning loads and loads of money from those images then it's not worth their while to chase you legally but obviously for ethically and morally you need to feel comfortable that, that they're comfortable with using that, those images. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the practical process with this your image here is a, a kind of vertical slice of the composition of the picture. I mean, it makes a very different image of it, obviously, aside from the colour um, changes as well and the creative decisions you've made within the painting. Um, wh- what is your kind of process of translation going from uh, a photograph like this to an actual painting? Um, I suppose it's about, um, well, finding the composition is the important thing and you can do that kind of one of two ways obviously you can do the traditional sketch in a sketchbook a little thumbnail sketch and just make some compositions uh, which is what I'd make my students do but what I more mm. often do is uh, crop it in photoshop a few times you know make different crops in photoshop and um, decide what you want or also what size canvas have you got all oh, right let's fit it on that then um, so you know and I do like these long kind of sort of figure shaped canvases um, so I think I just wanted to fit some I just wanted to make a few of this this shape canvas and so I was looking for images that would do something in that kind of vertical strip Mm -hmm. so yeah that's the way it works sometimes and then with the color in the background I don't remember why I chose that blue the drippy blue like I say it was very experimental it was very much um, what might this look like and then as the painting goes along I didn't know from the beginning how much of the grey and blue would remain and how much would be kind of painted up or painted over. Mm -hmm. And that's always really interesting. Um, And I suppose is kind of the theme of the workshop that I'm doing with you guys in in a few weeks, which is, you know, what what do you leave? Where do you stop? What elements might be stronger or more impactful without you fussing over them? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, May I click on to the next picture? Yes, please. So tell me a bit about these two here. Yeah, so these both uh, Nick Hedges inspired um, pieces as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But I suppose what's interesting about these is they both start with a kind of strong red under painting. And I usually do that in acrylic paint. So I'll start with a big strong colour or a a mixture of colours that's done in acrylic. So it dries really quickly. Um, I might do drips like the one on the left there. There's kind of drips or, or sort of smeary stuff or sort of texture. Um, 
And then when I paint over in oils, I will then feel how much of that background color needs to stay. And so these were also experimental pieces of just going, okay, so what looks good staying the background color and, and what looks good being painted up? Um, and the one on the right, the one with the with drinking the tea, this is also something I do quite a lot, which is um, borrowing a colour scheme from another artist. And I should have put the um, original painting beside it, but there's a Degas painting of these kind of two washerwomen, which is this kind of exactly yellow, that yellow and the, the brown and the, the white. And it's it, I just loved it so much. And I was like, I wanted to replicate those that colour scheme in this painting. So it was kind of the mixture of in, uh, someone else's photograph, someone else's painting, and then... <laughs> I, you know, and I know how to start. And then as you go along, you make the decisions. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's making decisions as you go along about how you might change things or where is the painting taking you in, in a different direction than maybe you even could ever have thought about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you sketch that out or does it happen on the surface of the final painting? Uh, just happens as, as I go along generally. Um, but like I said, I might in Photoshop, um, put some colors on top of the photograph or, or move figures around, you know, I can see so you can move figures together or apart and then you can put colors over the top so I can try and work out, is it gonna look good? What's what's the main color here? Um, so Photoshop is a bit like my sketchbook in a way because um, I can quickly see what kind of color relationships and darks and lights are happening, yeah. <laughs> I d Ramona's just asked whether you work with a limited palette of colours. I mean, do you, do you have your sort of go-to tube colours that you start with? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, it's nothing special. It's, you know, um, I might have generally like two blues, a dark and a light, two reds, a dark and a light, two yellows, um, some white, um, you know, brown. Nothing very special, and I use not very special paints most of the time as well, um, because I like to work quite big, so I quite like getting these big cheek tubes of, of oil paint. Um, but, you know, it depends. It depends. Some paintings, I will buy a special tube of paint, you know, and a really good, well, I know the colour is really amazing, and I'll make that the focus of the painting, more or less, of that colour is the thing, you know, so it kind of just depends on what I decide to, to use, and that can be completely arbitrary. Uh, mm -hmm. depending on how I feel. Presumably you're not still working on charity shop photo canvases. <laughs> no, but I do, I am a big fan of just using whatever you've got at the time and not being too um, worried that you need specialist materials because, you know, I've seen plenty of amazing stuff done on cardboard, you know, with a brush and a bit of black paint and that's, that it's all to do with with your vision and, and yourself as an artist more than the materials I think you're going to keep the conservators of the future in business trying to work out how to keep <laughs> lasting <laughs> <laughs> yeah um you, you would we were talking a little bit about images on the internet but um tell me a bit about your choices here yeah okay so these were again so this was sort of moving away from kind of maybe fame as for photographs and just looking around on the internet finding stuff that was interesting on the internet um and I don't remember what my so I mean the one on the right was definitely I did a, did do a whole series of ones of kind of Californian hippies and Woodstock inspired imagery um which I think I've seen every Woodstock photo um and I uh, there aren't any more left that I can look at um but, you know, I, I was really interested in this kind of, uh, I don't know, the ideology of the 60s, I suppose. You know, it's something I I just so wish I could have experienced. And I am I think that was a really wonderful thing to have happened. But at the same time, I suppose, I, I suppose like in this painting, I was really intrigued by the woman's face, you know, uh, with the children. Um, I knew I wanted to paint that face. That was basically the whole point of doing that picture, because... You know, she just looks, she looks a bit tired. She looks a bit <laughs> tired and she looks a bit like, oh, okay. You know, and I and I sort of thought that was a nice, um, I don't know, story happening there about the ideology, the hopes and the dreams and the um, the aspirations of that generation and, and kind of thinking about 
how that actually didn't play out and where we've got to now. But that's that's in my head. That's I think what I, what why I wanted to paint this um, these subject matters. And mm -hmm. um, the one on the left is uh, the, the sunbathing family. Um, don't know why I chose that. I think a lot of time I do paint a lot of people in swimming costumes, you know, mm -hmm. um, on bathing suits. And um, I think there's the good reason for that is that you get to paint bodies, right? You get to paint skin, you get to paint mm -hmm. legs and arms without it being a nude portrait or a nude painting, which is kind of something different. Um, nothing against that, can definitely do that. But this then tells a story without it being about that um and i can still pa and i can still paint legs and arms and skin which is fun <laughs> rather than clothes you know sometimes it's like oh i'm just painting a lot of the clothes it's not really what i'm what i want to do is it relevant that you don't know the people in the pictures um yeah, it's it's fine that I don't know the people. Uh, what I always sort of think is that it's not really a portrait. They're not portraits of people. They're not those people. There's just something about the relationship between them. Um, I mean, the, these the faces are a little bit more defined, like in this one on the right, but quite often the faces I don't define too much. Um, so I kind of feel like it's not about them. It's not about a portrait of them. It's something to do with the the relationship between the figures or the gestures or the uh, uh, or the, the body language, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And would you shoot your own photos um, or is it better for you as part of your process to to find and select these? No, I would. And I have. I, I did a I did a series of paintings last year where I took a big um, photo shoot and I really like that. Yeah, I love doing that. Um, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, it's just it's just more difficult it's just more difficult getting the 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 things that i want i suppose from from models i'm not a natural photographer maybe um but um i'd like to do more in the future yeah definitely brilliant now um, i can see people have asked some uh questions about mediums and uh, I'll, I'll put those to you at the end if that's okay amy and for everyone that's asked those questions thank you um but uh but tell me about these images um okay so the the sort of family group on the left there um this was just i think just a continuation of my fascination with family groups and um i suppose mostly sort of children's relationships with 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 the older people in the family i find really interesting um and this one as well, this was an experimental one in terms of like, I think I was painting on a piece of raw canvas, which is, you know, unprimed canvas, which means that it's quite sticky with the paint doesn't go on it very nicely. It kind of drags mm -hmm. and it clumps. And I think I was using water mixable oils as well, which I hadn't used before. So it was very much like, okay, this is what the paint's doing. And that's why there's not a lot of paint on that one actually, because just, I think it just wasn't handling the paint very well, but I thought, okay, we'll just leave it at that. Um, but uh, but I always like that one. Um, I love a, I love a snapshot of a family, especially when they're not posed. There is a there is a problem sometimes with vintage photography. If you're looking for people to paint, and you'll come across obviously a lot of posed photographs of people standing up straight, best smile on, you know, looking at the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not always what you want. You know, that's not always going to tell you much of a story. I mean, it will because you'll be able to read so much into everything in the whole picture you can pick up a story with whatever but um I do like these photos where there's a little bit more in between moments um where people aren't posed they're not looking at the camera or maybe one one person might be but they're they're caught in a natural moment um and I, I find that much more interesting which is why I think I, I started using movies a lot more where people were not standing up and posing for the camera mm -hmm. and it's something that we talk about a lot when I do do I teach courses sometimes about um painting from family photographs and there's a lot always a lot of talk about ah okay so what's the difference between a posed photograph where people are looking at the camera they're smiling they're expecting to be photographed and um images where they're caught in between which i think is possibly more interesting um sometimes mm -hmm. but um the one on the right here this was one uh it was a the, the, it's a big painting this one it's probably about 150 centimeters and it's um i had just painted the uh, the woman doing the handstand on the beach and it was 
I felt like there was just there wasn't enough stuff in the painting. It wasn't 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 interesting enough. And so sometimes um, sometimes what I do is I'll just add in a whole nother element on there just to see what happens because the alternative is to scrap the painting. So mm -hmm. before I scrap a painting, I'll try something weird with it usually, which I just think is is quite you know why not if you don't if you're not happy with it, you might as well do something strange. Mm -hmm. So I um, found this other image to kind of to work on top of the, the the first image, and I'm always really interested about how people read this um, because it's not quite clear what the figures are doing. Um, but I'll tell you what they are. They're actually figures from photographs from uh, the Yorkshire Ripper crime scenes. Um, so it's a famous sort of crime. Um, serial killer wasn't it in the late 70s early 80s um in yorkshire and i've always been really interested in those cases and i'm really interested in how it was handled and how the women were treated and how the it was kind of always groups of men dealing with the the case uh, and the cases were always about these women and it just seemed to polarize the whole of everything you might want to think about gender roles really and, and and place in society that I thought was really interesting. Have you come across anyone that's that's been able to kind of pick out the the meaning of that imagery uh, as well? If people are familiar with some of those kind of famous images. I think some people have sometimes said, yeah, it looks like, you know, maybe they're sort of like searching for evidence, which is which is what they're doing. But um yeah, no, I mean it's quite specific, I suppose. It's it's specific in my mind because I've I think it's I, I've done other pictures about this this um this subject matter before as well so it's always kind of there I always feel like there's a there's a lot of subject matter in there that I, I feel like I could still work with with the family group and it, I think it's, there's a real skill in uh depicting family relationships in a painting uh, and still making a good painting, you know, making something that isn't sort of very sentimental or, or sort of saccharine or, you know, something that will, will speak to somebody other than the painter and the the, the subjects of, of that familial group. So do, when you're teaching, do you, how do you find um, trying to kind of coach other people through making engaging paintings of, of a family group or of their family particularly? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's 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 always very interesting. Um, people seem to, you know, they they know who they want to depict and, and why. Um, the first thing we usually do is, I mean, it's a lot to do with kind of um, graphic sensibilities. At the end of the day, it's quite simply: have you got an image where you've got a strong composition, you've got strong darks, you've got strong lights. Um, Usually, I'm. We have a conversation usually about smiling uh, in in photographs, uh, um, and it's not a no. You can definitely paint pictures of people smiling. You're not going to find many of those paintings in the National Gallery, but there might be some. Um, but pe people smiling is historically quite a tricky thing to to depict, and so that quite often takes away quite a lot of the choice of subject matter that you might have um, if that's what you want to if you choose to do. So kind of people that aren't, you know, posed, aren't smiling. Um, that's the first thing that I try and get people to look at. But as well, doing just quick sketches, quick sort of thumbnail sketches using just a, a dark, a dark colour. So you've got the white of the paper and the dark of the paint. It's going to really quickly show you what a strong image is going to be. Contrasting lights and darks. Uh, uh, interesting figure arrangement. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's you know you can do that really quickly with um with with simple thumbnail sketches I find. Thank you. It's just I um I always imagine it must be very hard. I I don't really paint people that I know um very well as as portraits of of those people. Um, it's always been a long time since I've painted, but I think you what you seem to manage to balance so well is a sense of humanity and sort of human connection in the work whilst also still kind of keeping this fascinating sort of sense of of the mysterious image the kind of un you know the sort of unknown um present and balancing that with making an engaging painting that uses the the visual language of painting effectively so thank you it's re really helpful hearing all of that that's okay um, i mean i think it's a lot to do with, i mean a lot of people ask me about 
the definition of the face you know and and what is how to think about how how defined do you get and how detailed do you want to go on the face and it's it's a constant question with me as well because my natural instinct is to put in all the definition mm -hmm. and i like to paint you know portraits and i like to paint everything and i it's one of the most enjoyable things ever is trying to do everything on the face you know to, to paint that in but you know i think i realized that that wasn't what i needed for these kind of paintings you know it wasn't about like i say it wasn't a portrait it wasn't about them mm -hmm. it wasn't so much a portrait it was something else and so having less defined facial features um helped i think helps people uh, connect with it maybe um read it if they're not so, to get too, too worried about the, the the portrait perhaps especially when it's people you don't know isn't it it's always a bit strange to have uh paintings of people you don't know on your wall so maybe mm -hmm. there's part of that as well the the ambiguity of the portrait can allow us to like you know put another face in there in our minds even if um it's not actually the person that we know yeah, and I quite often get that. So I quite often get people say, um, oh, yeah, that's that's me and that's my brother and that's mm -hmm. my mum, you know, and I'm like, okay, great. You know, never could never have known that, would never have possibly have been able to organise that, but that's you're reading that into it, so it's lovely. I think that that's a great skill as well, to leave room for the viewer in a painting. Mm -hmm. And your images seem to do that to allow us to kind of actually be present in in these images even though they are so distant from us yeah um, I did, jane's asked a question about your brush strokes and i feel like this this is a relevant pair of images in here um is, is there anything you could say about the kind of brushes you use or the way that you relate to the surface of the painting when you're making your brush strokes um not not really i mean I feel like I'm a, I'm I'm not a particularly technical painter. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I do kind of just make it up as I go along. But I suppose what I do have an awareness of is um differences. And I've already sort of talked about darks and lights are like to me are very important. Um I do like a good strong contrast, whether that's with tonal values, dark and light, or whether it's with complementary colours like orange and green. It makes a good picture. It's a it's a graphic device, right? Using um, darks and lights and using complementary colors. It it why not play with that, and and have fun with it. And I suppose as well, it's it's differences in the brush strokes, which is thick and thin. So you know, watery or washy or glazy kind of areas or background colors that that is very flat, very scrubby, and contrasted with thick, glossy impasto sections i think that's exciting it's exciting for the eye isn't it to to see mm -hmm. these kind of differences in a work so i suppose i'm always a bit aware of that of trying to make sure that i'm changing stuff up a lot mm -hmm. um i'm gonna click through to these so what's happening in these images uh this is when i discovered fluorescent paint uh -huh. um, and these so these are done in acrylic well the one on the right has got a bit of oil on it but they're mostly acrylic um so yeah and they also I mean the one on the left there that that's a big painting with these mountaineer people and that was just a photograph that I found and it, it sort of as soon as I saw it online it was like that's a painting it's fully formed exactly how it is I need to paint that and um so I basically just painted it and made up the colors black and white photo so um could make up the colors and I decided to just keep it all within this kind of um tonal reddish pinkish purplish range the white of the on on her on the left there. There's the white of the on flashing across the shirt. Um, mm -hmm. They were all areas that I actually taped up in it beforehand. So I drew it out and then I've taped up the the white areas. So that's just the white of the canvas, which is something I quite like um, mm -hmm. because that's going to be the best white you're ever going to get is that white of that canvas. Um, but also, I quite often a lot of the areas are very thinly painted, so you're using the white of the canvas to bring a a glow to your colors um mm -hmm. so if you put a thin wash of acrylic down on top of a, a piece of white paper or a piece of or, or a canvas um the white canvas is going to work for you and it's going to create a beautiful glowing color that you couldn't possibly recreate in any other way so a lot there's a lot of that going on in that one it's the the, the whole painting because it's done in lots of sort of fluorescent colors it's literally blinding it and it makes the whole room go red which is quite pleasing <laughs> um 
and the one on the right um this was from a, a video i think that i freeze framed and yeah that was just another uh, experiment with fluorescent paints and and an orange um which was which was good fun um and that little the girl that's kind of painted out was just really someone that I painted about 700 times and then realized that maybe I just paint her out and just she can be a strange ghostly figure mm -hmm. um but yeah there's um what I, so I suppose I realize around this sort of time as well is that you know I do love painting faces um but maybe not always want to do portraits so how can I paint lots of faces so just painting big group scenes or multiple figure compositions was was something I started getting really interested in. And how do you kind of make decisions about um, which faces to kind of pull out, which ones to kind of push back and allow to kind of disappear into the, the shapes of the composition? I mean, a lot of the time it just happens naturally because um, I'll do the initial kind of sketching um, like for these ones that there'd be a lot of a, sort of like marks of acrylic and I just do like kind of shadow shapes you know the shadows of eye sockets and under the nose and under the chin um and that's something I'm always trying to teach with my students as well is you know forget about description forget about eyelashes forget about nostrils forget about all this kind of stuff that gets distracting on a face and just concentrate on these these dark shadow shapes that show a nose coming forward and eyes being set back in the face that's much more important than the eye itself mm -hmm. um so sometimes i'll do the kind of the, the kind of rough blocking in of these kind of shapes and i'll just go oh that looks great like that i'm just going to leave it so it kind of just happens as you go along i might probably have an idea of maybe the hero of the the painting that needs to have a more fully formed face but the others see how they go Brilliant. And um, lockdown portraits. So tell me about these. Yeah, so, um, yeah, when we went down into to lockdown, um, I had lots of lovely walks with my friends, as most of us did. Um, and it coincided with also getting diagnosed with breast cancer at the time. So I had time off work, so I didn't even have to do the dreaded um, Zoom lessons with my students. And I had lots of time to paint. So <laughs> for me, it was quite a good time. I know it's not wasn't great. Obviously, getting cancer is never going to be great, is it? But thankfully, I got really well treated, and um, I had this bit of time off, really. Um, and I started painting in all seriousness, and I did these portraits of my friends. I thought I'm just going to, I'm going to practice my portraiture, and I'm going to paint these pictures of my friends. Um, and yeah, that was it, really. There are all these little. 30 by 30 squares and I did loads and loads of them and um, I this was kind of the precursor to a couple of things that happened I suppose we can go on to the next slide Jake um, which was uh, because the doing those portraits got the attention of in a circuitous route it was to do with the uh, a thing called the portrait artist of the week show that they were doing on the internet and you'd paint a picture of a celebrity and you'd post it on Instagram. And it was just a kind of like paint along happy time while we were all sitting at home. And I'd done a few of these and I posted one of them on Instagram and the Tate saw it. And they obviously checked out my portraits that I'd been doing with my friends. And they asked me to do a, a live stream um, for International Women's Day mm -hmm. where I painted Cornelia Parker, who's this amazing artist. Um, not, not She wasn't live with me. I was painting from a photograph. Um, and so, yeah, I had all this set up in my room and I painted for two hours and I just talked and, um, yeah, it got like 250,000 people watched it. Um, but really it was just me standing in my room, in my studio, talking to myself for two hours, um, not really knowing what was going on, but that was, that was wonderful and amazing, obviously, to be asked by the Tate Gallery to do something. And they were obviously asking various people to do things to entertain people during lockdown and to, to show processes and so that was wonderful to get asked for that and shortly after that um I was also on portrait artist of the year so that's I, that I applied with one of my portraits self portraits and yeah and got on to that and that was super fun um difficult challenging um not 
not the easiest um, situation to have to paint a portrait. Don't even look at that painting behind my head. Now I've told you to look at it, you're going to look at it. Um, <laughs> wasn't my finest painting, but it was okay. You know, I'm glad I actually put some marks on a paint on a on a canvas. That was that was quite an achievement in that situation. Uh, but it was it was uh, it was a fun experience, and it's a it's a great show. If 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 you're in America or ever you haven't seen it, it's a, a brilliant program that we have over here where you can just watch people painting portraits for an hour every week, which is super fun. And as I found out, you can go back and rewatch yours on Now TV very easily. So I very much enjoyed going back to that previous episode. Oh God, well, I've only ever seen it once. It's not happening again. <laughs> <yet. laughs> come across very well. I think it's great. Um, but th this must have been a real shift in profile, kind of doing these really high profile um, sort of broadcast events. Did that feel like a big shift for you or what, what kind of impact did it have? Yeah, I mean, definitely did. I mean, um, uh, I don't, I couldn't say that anything major kind of definitely came of it. I, you know, nothing particular came of it. But um, you know, I suppose a big boost in Instagram followers, which in Instagram, what it seems to be is that once you kind of start rolling those numbers up, don't ask me how you do it. It just, if you're lucky enough for something, some get some sort of boost to start rolling the numbers up. Um, it just kind of happens you know of getting more and more followers the more followers you get the more followers you get um so that's been amazing because instagram is you know this is an unprecedented platform for artists that that's you know any artist of any time in, in the past history would have would have killed for so you know it's it that's a really wonderful thing and that obviously now is really the primary place where people find you and they find out about you um so I guess that's the main thing is getting the Instagram profile up, which is where other stuff comes from and people find you and people ask you to do things or, or ask you about things. So, oh, and then this is quite a shift. Um, tell me about working from home movies. Okay, yeah. So this was um, a sort of direction I took a couple of years ago, which was not working from still photographs as much anymore. And using archive films, uh, like other people's home movies, um, to find my own imagery. And I think the reason I sort of went down this route as well was it, it kind of felt satisfying to be able to watch movies and to freeze frame my own stills. So I couldn't be there, but this is the next best thing of being there, is being able to take my own photograph, uh, you know, one that's hopefully never been taken before, you know, a particular still. Um, so this was really exciting when I discovered this. You get these huge banks of um, archive films in libraries, like the New York City Library has one, and they have one here in Sussex, which is um, people just submit as part of kind of social documentary, really, so, so social history. Um, and you can sit and you can watch them from home. So I really just love watching these. They're so moving. They're so poignant. And also because they're from this area, I feel like I've got a connection. I feel like it's relevant to me. Um, and so I've really enjoyed going through those movies and, and finding figures and faces and relationships and gestures and things happening um, within those movies. Um, and some of them, sometimes they're black and white, so you can just project whatever colour you're interested in onto them or sometimes. They are coloured and sometimes they've got colour color casts over them. So they might be all be soaked in red or soaked in blue. And that will give you an idea about a painting. Or um, sometimes, most of the time, they're really out of focus and, and blurry, which is also interesting. So that it means that you can't get, again, get too lost in fiddly detail. And you get a bit more freedom to, to maybe be imaginative. I, I do love the idea as well that taking a still from a, a video like this is taking your own photograph of that past moment. That's fabulous. Yeah, they're, they're, so, they're so poignant to watch, um, you know, and people just seemed, I don't know, they, they seemed happy. And I guess they're not, you know, that's to be simplistic, but, you know, there was a lot of happiness and there was a lot of fun times and there was lots of fates and processions and... Um, garden parties and family holidays on the beach and you just think like oh it's so so full of joy 
and promise. And um, I suppose that sometimes makes me feel a little bit sad for, you know, that we don't do so much of that stuff anymore, community stuff and um, I don't know, togetherness stuff. Are you kind of reflecting on some of these things as you're painting? I mean, did it, what what is your painting process like? Do you sort of go off into something relevant to the painting? Do you put a podcast on? Um, no, I I kind of I think I've got to a stage where it's I kind of realise that you just trust the process, you trust the choosing process. So, and that's everybody has that right. So you can go through photographs, you can go through movies, and you will choose what you choose, and you will be the person to choose. The particular thing that you choose and I guess right I just trust that now so I see something I know it's good I know it's interesting I don't know why choose it look at it paint it and then afterwards I think you start to piece together meaning and connections and um you know why have I done this what what is the linking theme um amongst all this I don't usually know at the time before I, I do it it's just picking the images and now I kind of feel like just trust that just do that don't question mm -hmm. it find the interesting thing paint it and then see how it all sorts into place yeah. and um, tell me about these paintings here um so the one on the left here so I went down a big rabbit hole for quite a while of painting um or looking for images of uh, scout camps um mm -hmm. and I, I got loads of good photographs uh, uh well videos of scout camps um, and this was this was from one of those movies where they've just taken a bit of time off to go swimming in the lake, and there was just this great shot of them walking down through these trees, um, ready to go swimming. Um, just strong. I, again, I, I love, I love a, I love a swimming costume or a bathing suit, as, as you say in America, um, because it just gives you that chance to look at the gesture and and the, the figure and the skin and which I just think is so evocative and um, tells a beautiful story about that person. I mean, that's the people's personality is built within your physicality, isn't it? It's something to do with your, your body. Um, and so when you see bodies, as, as you know, you know, they, they, they can sort of tell a strong story about that person. And it can be as much about how somebody holds themselves as, um other aspects of their physicality yeah yeah absolutely yeah and um yeah so there's, there's another scout painting there so these these were I love doing these because it kind of indulged my enjoyment of painting faces lots of little faces but you know it was also a composition exercise like a a landscape a landscape of pinks and greens um seeing how it's kind of all goes together and what bits are going to work in what relation to other bits um i literally could paint groups of scouts all day every day i would be very <laughs> happy <laughs> but not as popular for people to buy i found out um so right. it's probably not a good idea for me to do that but okay so you, you've got to at least yeah diversify a little bit not yeah. just <laughs> But then, uh, and the one on the right there, oh, sorry, the, the one on the right, there was just a, an image from um, a sort of Butlins holiday camp, which was also somewhere, I've got lots of good imagery from kind of holiday camps of the 1960s. Um, but then I also kind of mixed the the photograph with a famous painting. Oh, and I can't remember the name of the person who painted it. It's one of the Glasgow boys and it's in, it's in the, the Kelvin, Kelvin Grove Art Gallery, but there's these kind of Druids, druids coming down a hill and it's such a brilliant picture and I basically just tried to steal as much of the colour scheme and the, the placement of the figures from that as possible. And that's that's a, a great sort of piece of advice for people, I think, to kind of borrow in that way, borrowing aspects from the colour scheme, the feel of different things, as well as the, the shapes, the imagery from other reference images. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I think it's a really good thing to do. Have a painting that you love in front of you like have the book open or the, the image on the screen mm -hmm. when you start the painting uh, when you're painting and just try and copy it you know to, to copy the color scheme so it usually won't last very long you know and you'll decide to do something else but at least it gives you a, a framework to start with and um i mean talking about sitting alongside historical painters um what happened here oh yeah so this was um 
the Society of Scottish Artists put out a kind of open call to apply to respond to works in their collection for their um, their anniversary show last year. And um, yeah, so I applied to, um, they had a various different um, artworks that you could say, I would like to respond to this one. And so I wanted to respond to this, basically because it was the only figurative piece in there. There was lots of landscape and abstract stuff and a sculpture and stuff. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. that one's got a person in it. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll apply for that. And yeah, so I, I got it. And so you got you got a kind of um, a bit of money and then they just said, you know, come back with your response. And they didn't say anything about what that was. What does a response mean? I have no idea. So what I ended up doing, this was when I actually did that thing of where I took my own photograph. So I did a photograph shoot with my my friend. Um, and the, the picture is of, it's called the sick girl or the sick child. Um, it's one of his famous images. He's got a painting of it as well. but. Um, my friend, um, yeah, she she she'd been struggling with eating disorders all her life, and I thought it would be really interesting to try and um, say something about that. Um, and so we did this great photo shoot, and I got loads of good photographs. And I ended up painting seven paintings, big paintings, not knowing what the best one was going to be or the best way to respond to it. Um, and anyway, and just decided to choose this one in the end. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was up in the big. Um, Royal Academy of Scotland in Edinburgh and you know I had Monk's picture next to me and had a, a Rodan sculpture like you see in the front there so that was a, a great moment. And I mean this feels like an appropriate moment to bring Maggie's question in because obviously I mean the, the, we've sort of seen quite an astronomical rise um, of your painting you know the development of your painting since 2019 and the accompanying success of your work and, and growth of your audience. Um, Maggie's asked whether you were previously uh, an art teacher um, and whether you were able to leave that role, but you you are currently an art teacher, right? Yeah, 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 I'm still an art teacher. Yeah, so um, I have gone down in my hours a bit. So um, I, I've got a bit more time to do my own painting now, but I'm not quite yet at the stage of, of becoming a full-time artist, um, partly because I really love my job as well. I'm really enjoying my job um, and it's not quite time to leave that yet, but it might be a nice thing one day to be able to paint full-time, but then I might stop speaking to people, which would not be good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the social aspect of my job and I love the, the people that I work with. And and I mean, talking to some of your past students as well, I know you are very much appreciated. I know you've contributed a huge amount to um, to, to their appreciation of, of art and their own processes and given a lot of them the confidence to actually pursue their, their art seriously. So I think that's something you should take a lot of credit for and um, something you're really contributing to the development of the young people at your school. So oh, would it be hard yeah. to leave that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, so I'm I'm loving these vertical compositions as well. I know you sort of talked on them a moment ago, but what's happening on the surface of this painting? The, uh, what, the middle one. Um, yeah. There's a lot of what you can't see is there's a lot of um, stencil texture. So that's something I've been doing a lot recently, which is building up acrylic um, patterns with um, kind of a texture gel and acrylic paint and stencils. Um, so sort of thinking about where the elements are going to be on the painting and then putting these kind of patterns in the background, which might contribute to, uh, you know, whatever it is being described on the on the surface. And this one's got lots of kind of raised sort of surfaces. And again, that's kind of, it appeals to me in a couple of ways. First of all, it gives, when you see the painting in real life, it's got that kind of pleasing texture and painterly impasto um, juiciness to it, you know, with all these these patterns on. But also, I mean, I really just, I, I love that that difference as, as well. I keep talking about differences, but the differences between detailed and uh, suggested, I suppose. And um, when you put patterns on things, patterns on dresses, patterns on a curtain, patterns on a sofa, pattern in a shirt, it's just, I just love it in a painting because then it might be contrasted with an undescribed face or something like that. I don't know. There's a good play off on pattern, as we know from uh, Bonnard and Goulard, you know, these kind of beautiful super patterned images which I, I really love so that's been something that seems to have been coming in more and more um over the last year or so is using these these stencils and all these are um these are all paintings from the, the solo show I had um in 
October, yeah, or September, mm -hmm. October last year. So this is kind of quite recent. And how did that show go? Were you happy with how it all hung together? I was really happy with it. It was absolutely brilliant. And it was just a delight to have been asked. And it's a lovely gallery, Cameron Contemporary, and beautiful, supportive people working there. So, yeah, it was a real dream, you know, real, like, wow, solar show, having your name on the door, it is, it is great. And I really enjoyed it. And so what's what's coming up next for you? Were these more from the same show? Yeah, that's more from the same show. Um, yeah, so I mean, this one on the right here, this purple painting is um, is actually in New York at the moment. It's in um, a, a gallery with an, two paintings of mine um, showing with four other artists and um, we're all new to the gallery and they've asked us to send some paintings over and I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm hoping that people are going to buy them and then, um, uh, you know, maybe I'll get to show some more over in New York um, in the future. I think is is this um more work including the stencils as well in here? Uh yes, yeah, so I've got all that sort of stencils in the on the wallpaper and on the floor of that one. Um yeah. Uh these are all yeah, long ones. I'm, I'm still quite interested in doing lots more big, huge sort of full length figure ones is what mm -hmm. I'd like to do in the future. But yeah, this is what's happening at the moment. So I've got some um got some work in New York. I've also got some work in a gallery in the Cotswolds called the Stratford Gallery, which is looks like a really nice gallery. I haven't visited yet, but it looks really great. And I um I'm working at the moment. I've been really busy for the last three or four months on this commission for Brighton College, which is a big school here in Brighton. And they're making a big giant new theatre building. Um and I I got asked to make some paintings for the new building. And so I've been making seven big, huge paintings based on their archive photos. Um, and yeah, I'm on the last one now. And it has been hugely enjoyable. Really, really enjoyed it. And hopefully I'll be able to sort of share those with everybody. And um, well, I haven't, I haven't quite finished them all yet, but when they're all finished, um, I'll be able to share them in, in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Uh, was was there a tight brief for this commission no they've been amazingly um loose with it actually i mean we, we did lots of backwards and forwards about the images where you know they had some images in mind and then i said yeah i think these ones will work better and then they said oh, okay so there was a few sort of like backwards and forwards about which images to use because they got they got a lot of old photographs it's a very old school it's been going since the 18 somethings um so they had lots of good photographs to work from so it was it was really really fun to do that um, but apart from that, they've just left me alone. It's been like, yep, yeah, off you go. I haven't, they haven't asked to look at them or told me how to do them or anything like that. So it's been wonderful. Fantastic. And obviously, um, in a few weeks' time, you're going to be coming to the studio in Brighton to talk about the, um, well, to teach on the unfinished portrait. Um, could you preview a little bit of what's going to be going on there? What, what, how do we know when a painting's finished? Well, I mean, th this course has been, has been making me giggle because I keep thinking about, OK, so wh what am I going to do? And I know what I'll do. I can just get people to start a portrait and I'll tell them they've got two hours to do it in. And then after an hour, I'm going to tell them to stop. Ooh. And that's it. That's all you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been making me laugh a bit. But no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to like I found lots of really great examples of, of unfinished work. Um, and I thought we could examine those a bit closer and sort of see what kind of um, devices other artists might have used or how they've done that or why they've done that. And then we'll practice with a bit of that. We'll do some exercises about, um, you know, how to maybe include more line or to include background color uh, um, and unfinished areas or something like that. And then we'll have a day of where we can sort of work something um, up a bit longer but not finish it i i mean i wish i could come along I, and it's fully <laughs> booked anyway so i can't but um for anyone that's kind of keen to look out for more I'll, I'll try and convince amy to come back and do another one afterwards um i did i won't put you on the spot right now though amy <laughs> um, <laughs> now i've i normally we'd have a little bit of time for questions and we've actually just kind of ticked over if you need to run off now amy that's totally okay we oh, can draw those but well if, if it's okay then just for a few more moments um mel's just asked uh the middle image before this looked like the girl from the haunted house in yorkshire um I, is that is that the, the enfield's haunting like there yeah the enfield yeah you're right yeah, it's, yeah so that was, 
that was a bit of a departure because that was that's a very well known photograph. So well done for spotting that. That's not a that's not a found photograph from a, a home movie, but it was a photograph that um like the kind of Yorkshire Ripper photographs that I've just been very, very um I've I've had with me forever for all my life, you know, just and I just like I want I need to do something with it. I need to work with this somehow. So um I yeah, I really enjoyed that. That's maybe something that I might look more in. You know, drawing drawing on pop uh, popular culture um or yeah, cultural uh, what would you call it identity you know um, stuff that we've got in our consciousness from our culture um i find very interesting that i mm -hmm. might might do more with and um, now i'm just going to ask one final question if that's okay amy and then we will draw things to a close but i've got a question that El ellen uh, sent in beforehand which i think is a great one to end on uh, and it's just asking in your opinion i'm quoting ellen here in your opinion what self-mining process must an artist do to move past simply drawing and painting a face well and to move into creating figurative work that's unique and authentic well, uh, it's quite interesting when you get started, start to get people asking you questions, you see, that is part of self mining, isn't it? People ask questions, and you have to think of an answer. Um, so therefore, you have to start thinking, okay, why am I doing this? What's happening here? I would say the number one thing that I think is, um, has been useful to me is, is writing, stream of consciousness writing. Um, so to just give yourself permission to write two or three pages of unfiltered text um and do that as many times as possible don't censor yourself and don't try and talk about anything in particular but things will emerge and things will come out and you'll start to find out what it is you're interested in i think um that is wonderful thank you amy i'm, I'm going to take us off of the screen share there but it has been just a, a real privilege to be able to have you on. So, um, and you've given some incredible answers to some of these questions as well, because it's always kind of tricky when you're just kind of thrown in on these things. But um, but thank you so much for your openness and for telling us all so much about your work. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking me. I really appreciate it. And um, now, uh, thank you everyone for coming along. It's been great to have you all here, of course. Um, this is going to be, this has been a recorded session and I will put the recording up on our YouTube afterwards if you wanted to come back to it. Um, I presume that everyone is a follower of, of Amy already on Instagram, but I'm just going to pop a little link to her Instagram there if you wanted to follow a little bit more of her work. Uh, and I'm going to draw things to a close there. So thank you again, Amy. Um, thank you everyone for coming and I hope you have a lovely rest of the day, rest of the evening um, and Amy, uh, I hope you have a nice chilled Friday night now or a wild one, whatever you're most in the mood for. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.